On this week in Enterprise Tech, we talked about there's an advanced set of surveillance wear coming out of Russia. Plus, Curtis talks about companies anonymizing their data but still might violate GDPR. Plus, Curtis, Brian, and I talk with Lori McMitty, Principal Technical Evangelist from F5, about DevOps, microservices, and Nginx. Twyat on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyat. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 352, recorded July 26th, 2019. Mo Silos, Mo Problems. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Worldwide Technology. Worldwide Technology's advanced technology center is like no other testing and research lab with more than a half a billion dollars of equipment, including solutions from key partners like Intel Corporation. And it's virtual, so you can access it 24-7. To learn more and get insights into all the offers, go to www.t.com slash twit. And by Hrefs. Whether you work for a big brand, run your own small business, or do freelance work, getting traffic to your website is always a challenge. Hrefs is an all-in-one SEO tool set that is here to help and give you the tools needed to rank your website in Google. To get a seven-day trial for only $7, go to hrefs.com to sign up. Welcome to Twyat, This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moresca, your guide through this big, giant world of the enterprise, but I can't guide you by myself. Let's bring in the experts, starting with our very own Mr. Brian McHenry, Director of Global Security Solution Architect at F5 Networks. Bam, how's it going, my friend? It's going well. We're uh, keeping real busy over here at F5, and uh, the Nginx integration is, uh, for the most part, complete, and everybody's out there in the world asking all the right questions. I, I've been really impressed by the, the, the customers and how they've received the news. Fantastic. Well, another person who is always busy and who needs no introduction, our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin, Senior Editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, what's keeping you busy down there? Well, Lou, right now we're all about getting ready for Black Hat. You know, it's uh, just a little over a week away, and uh, we're going to be out there learning all about scary security stuff in the desert. Uh, I'm talking to the people already, uh, making my plans, getting articles set up, and looking forward to uh, meeting with any of the Twyat Riot who happen to be out at Black Hat or DEF CON. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to the coverage. But folks, we, we do have a uh, pretty great show today. And in fact, we have some scary security stuff on the show as well today. We have, now that we're going to talk about some advanced surveillance wear that's coming out of Russia, but we're also talking about how companies might be anonymizing their data, but that might still be violating GDPR. Plus, we have a great guest, Lori McVitie from F5 Networks, to talk about DevOps, micro, microservices, and Nginx. But before we get into all that goodness, let's just go ahead and jump into this week's blips. Now, remember when your mom and dad told you to eat your vegetables? Well, you asked why, and they said, well, because I said so. Did you like that answer? Well, what if someone said that your data security and privacy was that way as well? Well, that's precisely what the U.S. Attorney General William Barr is saying to consumers about their data. Basically, consumers should just accept the risks that encryption backdoors pose to personal cybersecurity to ensure, ensure law enforcement can access encrypted communications. Now, this day and age, consumer privacy is more, of ca more cavalier to businesses and government agencies because of the drive for anonymity by people on the web. Well, today, new services are adding end-to-end -end encryption to their data systems, making it harder and harder for onlookers to get the data they need. Now, the government calls this going dark because they can't actually see encrypted communications, and it remains a key talking point amongst authorities. However... It's been ar argued by experts and researchers alike that the truth is there is no secure way to create a backdoor access. Cheating backdoors to encrypted communications for law enforcement opens the door to allowing malicious hackers to do the same thing. Now, why does Attorney General feel you should accept the backdoors? Well, because, quote, the residual risk of vulnerability resulting from incorporating a lawful access mechanism is materially more significant than those already in the unmodified product. 
He also believes that some argue to achieve a best slight incremental improvement in security, it's worth imposing a massive cost on society in the form of degraded security. He also said we're talking about consumer products here and services such as messaging, smartphones, email and voice and data applications, not talking about protecting the nuclear launch codes here. Now, essentially, your security and privacy are unimportant because you're a consumer, a plain Jane not really important because international security is more important. But, uh, you know, as you know, that what's done in Australia already in other countries, we already passed legislation that requires tech companies to hand over user data when requested by law enforcement, even in the means of building a back door into their encryption. Now, as business people and consumers, we might need to stay vigilant here that any government might be willing to get it passed into such law, especially in this country. New Linux worm is attacking IoT devices. A new Internet of Things bricking worm, malware designed to permanently disable the hardware it infects, is hitting Linux-based devices. And it appears the culprit responsible for the attack is 14 years old. Yes, 14. The new software, dubbed Silex, is running across the Internet looking for Linux systems deployed with default admin credentials. Once it finds such a system, it overwrites all the system storage with random data, drops its firewall rules, removes its network configuration, and then restarts the system, effectively rendering the device useless or bricked. This latest variant is very similar to methods used to build and propagate the Mirai and Perserai IoT botnets from a couple years back. These botnets were used to launch the first one terabit plus DOS attacks ever seen. It is even more similar to the follow-on worm-like botnet known as BrickerBot, which bricked in excess of 10 million devices before its author shut it down. These botnets are punishing those who use default admin credentials and exercising a sort of internet vigilantism by preventing these devices from being used for evil. However, no thought is given to what services might be getting caught by bricking and disabling them in this automated fashion. For more about the impact of vulnerable IoT devices, check out the latest research on F5labs.com where the sixth volume of the Hunt for IoT research series is soon to be published. Well, we have a well-known hacker sentenced to supervised release. It seems like you really can turn your life around and even sometimes get credit for it. Marcus Hutchins, a security researcher known for creating the kill switch that stopped the 2017 WannaCry ransomware attack, has been sentenced to time served and a year of supervised release for charges of creating and distributing the Kronos banking malware. The sentence was hounded down as part of a plea agreement in which he pleaded guilty to two counts in order to have six other counts dismissed. Judge J.P. Statmuller said he considered Hutchins' age at the time of the offense, which occurred when he was a teenager, and credited the 25-year-old researcher for having made a positive change in his life prior to his arrest. Over the years, Hutchins has developed a reputation as a top white hat industry analyst. Uh, the judge waived any fines, and Hutchins, who has been in Los Angeles on bail, can return to his home in the United Kingdom. Unfortunately, his criminal record will likely prevent him from re-entering the United States once he leaves. Now, Internet trolls, they strike everywhere, including social networks and chat rooms. But what people don't realize is it's actually a lucrative business as well. Now, in the Philippines, it's just become just that profitable in manila's hundreds of troll farms churning out fake content false narratives and anything else the client wants they make their money and the more they troll now whether it's trolling for a candidate running for philippine senate senate using a fake fake social media account to make it appear as if the candidate had a vast fervent base of supporters or it's smearing critics especially those who call them out for precisely the jobs they do Business is good. Across the Philippines, it's virtual, free-for-all. Trolls for companies, trolls for celebrities, trolls for liberal op op opposition pol politicians and the government. Trolls, troll and trolls. Now, critics, what are critics saying is that this is a foreshadow of the trends that will happen in future elections and in the global markets as well. Well, why, why is this? Well, because the ambitious operators not want to turn their country into the go-to place to influence corporate and political campaigns worldwide using the same young, educated, English-speaking workforce 
that made the Philippines a global call center and content moderation hub. Now, to prove their worth for a specific Senate candidate, candidate, for example, they hired trolls that worked around the clock to flood platforms such as Twitter, Facebook with seemingly organic messages of support. Now, fans leaped to his defense, debated his critics, and sang praises of his leadership style ahead of crucial midterm elections that were held in May. But it's all an illusion manufactured by hundreds of fake accounts, all meticulously tracked on a spreadsheet. Troll farms are coming. Are you ready? The FTC, and related to my first blip, has settled a lawsuit with a major IoT vendor. And so while I sound like a broken record, patch and update, patch and update, patch and update, the danger is here that as all too many IoT manufacturers are using ancient Linux kernels, and with these geriatric kernels come some very well-known vulnerabilities. So IoT vendors, beware. Remember what just happened to D-Link? You could potentially be seeing a class action suit and some aggressive legislation if you don't get a clue. You can get an up-to-date price, uh, an up-to-date Linux kernel for the same price as the ancient one, and testing and integration tasks are a teeny tiny fraction of the cost of a class action lawsuit or legislation like what just hit D-Link. D-Link's egregiously bad security practices on their early webcams will officially cost them big time as a result of this suit. There's no small irony that these webcams, most often deployed to improve home security, actually introduce huge security and privacy issues for anyone who deployed them. As part of the settlement, D-Link agreed to provide support and patches through 2030 and implement many checks for the products both pre- and post-release. D-Link must also submit to regular audits by the FTC to ensure they are adhering to these new practices all of which adds up to significantly greater operational expenses for D-Link to produce and support new products. Other IoT vendors should be on the lookout, as it seems the government is finally getting serious about protecting consumers and enforcing better practices. Well, when a security researcher needs to create an application, there are a lot of choices in terms of programming languages and frameworks. But when the project requirements include SSL, and an embedded IoT platform, the number of good options, well, it goes down. That's why a researcher named Thomas Pornin decided to build his own language. Language Pornin wanted to build had two significant requirements. First, its resulting applications had to fit into a resource-constrained IoT device, and those applications had to perform reasonably well. Next, the applications developed using the language would not be subject to certain built-in vulnerabilities he saw as being there in some applications. So Pornin wrote a 65 page definition for the language, which he called T0. He decided the design, huh, he decided to base the design of his secure IoT language on Forth, a programming language that's been around for a good while and is oriented around the idea of stacks. In the next version called T1, which Pornin described in a presentation at NorthSec 2019, protection for memory and restrictions on stacks were introduced. He's still rolling out improvements in the now open source project and hesitates to suggest that every security pro needs to write their own language. It is useful though for developers and security practitioners to understand how compilers work and the kind of code they produce. Understanding whether they create code that makes the most of memory protection and memory structures available in the hardware can help everyone write more secure, more robust applications. Now we talk about data breaches all the time due to companies paying less attention to security over profit or agencies using old tech. Are they impactful? Of course they are. But what if I told you that the citizens data from an entire nation was leaked? Does that put that into a different perspective? Well, think about this. Five million Bulgarians had their data stolen by hackers from the country's tax revenue office. Now, this means that every working adult in the entire country had their data taken. Now, a 20-year-old cybersecurity worker has been arrested by the Bulgarian police in connection with the hack. However, officials still don't know how the data breach happened. Now, remember those strict data protection laws that came into effect last year across the European Union? Well, they also have placed a new burden on anyone who collects and stores personal data, but it also introduced a hef hefty fine for anyone who mismanages data, potentially opening the door the Bulgarian government to be penalized itself. 
of the breach. Now, the notion that the governments urgently need to step up their cybersecurity game is not new, but experts have been ringing alarm bells for years. But what's the problem here? Well, of course, out-of-date systems and education of the operators. Let's hammer it home, folks. Update, update, update. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to those bites, we have to thank a great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, and that's Worldwide Technology. Now, Worldwide Technology began building their like advanced technology center about 10 years ago, and it's grown exponentially. It's like no other testing and research lab out there. And the lab contains more than a half a billion dollars in equipment from hundreds of OEMs and key partners ranging from, ranging from high-tech heavyweights like Intel, Dell EMC, HPE, and Cisco to emerging disruptors like Equinix. Now, WWT is a trusted partner who stays with you over the years. Many of the customers have been with them for over a decade because they know WWT is where they can go to get their answers they need to ensure their businesses run right. Now, their ATC is an incubator for IT innovation and, and it actually offers hundreds of on-demand integrated solution labs representing the newest advanced in multi-cloud architecture, artificial intelligence, IoT solutions, and more. Now, learn about products before you launch because WWT's engineers use these environments to quickly spin up proof of concepts and pilots using the sandboxes so customers can actually confidently select the best solution. And in many cases, actually reduces concept time from months to weeks, which is actually increases your speed to market. They actually offer lab as a service. It's a dedicated lab space within the ATC where here customers can actually perform Programmatic testing using those vast technology ecosystem that WWT has built over the years. It's virtual, so you can actually take full advantage of it and anywhere around the world 24-7. WWT engineers work in these labs every day. They beta test new edge-to-cloud solutions based on the latest and greatest Intel technologies. And they're building reference architectures and custom integrations to help their customers make decisions and see results faster and with much less investment. Now, later this summer, WWT will be launching a new digital platform with hands-on access to more than 200 lab environments. To learn more about ATC and get insights into their newest features with demos and labs, go to www.com slash twit. WWT simplifies the complex. That's www.com slash twit. WWT delivering business and technology outcomes around the world. And we thank Worldwide Technology for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, let's go ahead and jump into this week's bites. Now, Fancy Bear is taken to wearing a monocle. Now, someone is packaging powerful malware and fake versions of popular Android applications such as Skype, Signal, and Pornhub. Now, dubbed Monocle, the malware can actually exfiltrate data from third-party applications by reading text displayed on the device's screen at any point in time. Now, there may be an iOS version lurking somewhere, but Monocle was developed by the Russian Special Technology Center, a group linked to the GRU, Russian's military intelligence agency, which is actually centered in St. Petersburg. Now, what is you what what is this what is this malware you ask? Well, Monocle Monocle is actually advanced mobile malware designed to collect and exfiltrate your data from infected devices. Now, what can it do? Well, it's got a laundry list of stuff that it can do. I'll go through some of them here. It can retrieve calendar information, uh, names of events, when there are, where they're at, perform man-in-the-mill attacks against HTTPS. It can collect information about messages. It can retrieve out-of-band messages. It can send text messages. It can record. It can do pretty much just about any scary thing you can imagine. Now, uh, this malware is actually uses familiar methods to get this information in novel ways, and it actually is super highly effective. It's actually functionality uses profiling of the user it targets, determining their interests, and then it seats actually uses those to exploit potential root access to most privileged levels of a control. When it actually achieves that, it acts as it actually able to overwrite security certificates to intercept and potentially change incoming and outgoing information, sometimes called man-in-the-middle attacks. But it can operate in steel data even when it can't access the root. Now, Monocle surveillance where capabilities have appeared in Trojanized applications, like I was saying, Skype, Signal, and many other applications. Now, this is this is pretty scary because this means that not only these this is this vendor, this this attacker able to 
embed this, but it's also able to get access to data that these applications didn't have access to. Now, guys, I want to throw this over to you. Curtis, I want to start with you. Uh, we, we've heard of this before, and we've, we've, we've known about many applications, people in installing them or sideloading them, not through the stores. Uh, but these are, these are actually, people are actually installing these things. They're not realizing this. Is this just the beginning? Is, do we have to impose maybe new standards around how applications are deployed to mobile devices? Well, if you want to be secure, side loading is never a good idea. And it's a it's a more difficult problem for Android than it is for Apple devices because there are a number of legitimate Android app stores. You know, with Apple you have the Apple, you know, app store and that's it. If it comes from anywhere else, it's bad. With Android you can have a number of, of quite legitimate sources for applications. I had a chance to talk with the researchers who, who found this, and they were impressing on us the fact that this particular campaign was targeted as best they can tell on some very specific individuals. And they, they reached that conclusion because of the very specific applications that were carrying this payload. But there's nothing that's in the technology of Monocle that ties it to specific individuals. In other words, this could very easily be used for a broad-based campaign. And since it could be used for a broad-based campaign, that means that everyone needs to worry about it. And, and this is the kind of software that, that really can be a nightmare. You know, you listed some of the capabilities. It has even more that... that are, are fascinating. One of my favorites of its capabilities is that it can go in and scrape the auto completion dictionary. So it will have an idea, it can give the threat actors an idea of the words you use most often um, based on what's in that auto completion dictionary. Uh, so this was very well developed, very skillfully built software. Um, not so much for the individual techniques but for the collection of techniques, that means that once this is on your device, those threat actors can know pretty much all there is to know about you and your company or your uh, um, NGO or whatever organization you're part of. So you're absolutely right. It, it's time to start getting serious about putting some limits on where people who are going to be attaching to organizational networks, whether it be a company, a big enterprise, uh, a government agency, an NGO, make some, some pretty hard and fast rules about where those folks can get the apps that they put on their phones. That's interesting you say that because I know a lot of organizations out there, they have this concept of a corp catalog where they might develop apps internally that are not distributed through the main stores like the Android App Store, uh, Play Store, or even iOS or uh, the App, App Store through a Apple. So they, they kind of have these, they have to have the ability to, to kind of install these enterprise applications uh, through that route. But again, like we've talked about with the whole backdoor mechanism, anytime you offer this in a platform, you tend to also offer it to attackers as well, to hackers as well. So Pam, I want to throw this over to you is, you know, we see this a lot. Organizations, they need to be able to, to work offline. They need to be able to store applications. Is this just a way, is there, is there, is there time to, for like applications and platforms like Android and iOS to stop allowing this or is there a better way? Um, so there's not much you can do. People want to bring their devices to work. They want to have access to their device at all times, maybe even use it dual purpose. There's plenty of MDM solutions that'll stop you from using rooted or jailbroken devices on corporate networks. So the enterprise has a lot of countermeasures here. Um, what they don't have, uh, is something to stop you from doing this with your personal device, right? So if we think about, you know, the threat model here that, that Kurt was describing in his, in his conversations with the researchers, it's, uh, the highly targeted individual, say a Senator, a CEO, someone of that nature, uh, this person's targeted, um, We've locked down all the devices that are our devices, right? The ones that we manage or we have issued uh, as an enterprise. 
but they're still going to want to carry around or, or there's nothing to stop them uh, unle- uh, aside from really strict physical security from carrying around an unmanaged device, uh, which, you know, they, they may use for, you know, other communications, right? They, you know, learning how they speak, learning you know, from their autocorrect dictionary. So it's it's really down to the individual responsibility in many cases when it, we're talking about the enterprise, right? The enterprises have, have had, the, had the tools for a while and have mostly implemented them, particularly where they have high net worth or high uh, value individuals uh, because of, you know, nation state threats and that sort of thing. Where I'm more concerned is that somehow we continue to let Google and Amazon off the hook for not vetting the content that ends up in their app stores. Uh, You know, Apple, love them or hate them, want to bash on the walled garden that is iTunes that generates revenue for them. We We can talk about all the different pros and cons of that, but the number one pro for me, and I carry around an iPhone by choice, the number one pro for me is I don't have to do the security job because I know Apple is doing the best they can. And it's hard to get compromised content into the the Apple iTunes store. It's fairly hard to jailbreak an iPhone. Um, you know, These are realities of how they've built I- iOS. They've made it harder to do this. Android has embraced an open approach, uh, and that's fine. And I think people should have the right to modify their, their devices. But... When it comes to you know they managing these app stores, Google and Amazon, I think get get way too little criticism for not vetting this content with the same scrutiny uh, that the the what Apple provides for for the iTunes uh, app store. Yeah, that's interesting. They brought it up. I mean, this world in the nowadays with the whole bring your own device, you know, you're finding these things where people are bringing more than one device. One might be MDM managed, and the other one might not. And like you said. Uh, you know, this one being an Android device could be breached. It could be the one that's listening and and watching things, and it could be the weakest link here. But that doesn't mean that MDM is also useful as well, right, Kurt? Well, it was interesting. I would we we think of MDM as being a, an essential component in protecting enterprise networks from rogue uh, mobile devices, and in general, it is. But I was talking to a researcher earlier today who was talking about um, some some attacks that they found. Uh, he mentioned India as a place where a threat actor managed to put a compromised MDM system into the field. So a, a, a victim would grab this MDM system, install it, and it would go through all of the steps of providing MDM-based security for the devices attacking or attaching to the network. The problem is that it would secretly be skimming all of the data coming in through those mobile devices and sending it off to the attacker's C2 servers. So, you know, we're, we're at the point where it is very difficult unless you're going through known very trusted channels to say that you're doing everything you can to secure your mobile devices. This is a, this is a tough environment. And the fact is we've been used to the idea of a very low cost of entry for getting into say desktop or laptop malware for quite a while. You don't even have to be a particularly skilled programmer these days to go out and find all the malware components you need, paste them together, uh, lease time, on a a C2 server farm, and you're in business as an attacker. It's been more difficult than that for mobile devices, but that is changing with um, things like Monocle and some of the other recent attacks we've seen. We're, we're, We're seeing the commodification of the malware code, and it's going to become a bigger and bigger problem, especially as we move from things like surveillance wear, which is what Monocle is, to uh, to ransomware, which we're now beginning to see in mobile devices. Uh, it's a changing world, and people really are going to have to change their understanding of what it means to have a secure device. Thanks, Kerr. Well, let's go. Let's put that one to bed. I think I, this the next one is actually fairly interesting and applies to a lot of companies out there. Companies are trying to comply with GDPR, but they're actually also anonymizing their data to still collect information like system health, app health, that kind of thing. But 
this actually still might violate GDPR. Is that right, Kurt? Well, yeah, you know, this whole notion of anonymized data has been around for a while. Uh, I came across it the first time um, during uh, research for HIPAA. Uh, companies that, for example, were using a third party to do records processing for patient data would anonymize that data before shipping it out of house. That way they could have some a third party work on the data without risking violation of the HIPAA regs and, and releasing sensitive patient information. With GDPR and some of the other privacy regulations that are now coming into place, we're seeing more and more companies depend on anonymization of data. You know, the, the European Union has said that if you encrypt data, that that is sort of de facto proof that you have taken all the steps you need to take to protect the data. Uh, randomization is one of those things that doesn't go quite to the step of encryption. And it means that you can use a third party to do some critical processing. And you can also use it, as, as you mentioned, Lou, for things like um, quality assist, assurance, uh, quality control, product development, all those good things. But what's happened now is that three academic researchers have shown that 99.98% of Americans could be re-identified from an otherwise anonymized data set if that data set includes 15 demographic attributes. And those findings suggest that even the current policies like GDPR may well fall short of truly protecting citizens. In, uh, this paper uh, uh, appeared in Nature on July 23rd, and they conclude that, quote, even heavily sampled anonymized data sets are unlikely to satisfy the modern standards for anonymization set forth by GDPR and seriously challenge the technical and legal adequacy of the de-identification, release, and forget model, end quote. Basically, what they're saying is that with all of the data that's available, and big data techniques, you can reassemble data and re-identify individuals even if you've gone through the steps of doing things like removing names and addresses and, and other things that are supposed to be key identifying features. The researchers say that again and again and again, they've learned that anonymization of data is extremely hard because People are unique. And that means that the data around them is unique. Once you have that unique data, you can re-identify them. Now, what the um, organizations like the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services currently requires that businesses remove 18 different classes of information from files uh, or have an expert review their anonymization techniques to certify that as non-identifying. What these researchers are saying is that that's a nice try, but it's not enough. It is just too easy, they say, with modern techniques to bring identity back into what should be anonymous data. So they prove that re-identification is easy and it may leave companies with no easy answers on whether following current guidelines will be enough to protect the anonymity of the information in their care. So what we need to do, they say, is find other better ways to truly anonymize data. Now I want to turn to my co-host and Brian, I'm going to turn to you first. Does the rise of these big data techniques for reassembling data from a lot of different sources mean that we're going to have to think about the ideas of personally identifiable information in a whole new and different way? Well, it's absolutely, uh, Kurt. I think the, the thing that, that I'm reading more and more about is uh, zero knowledge data transfer, where only one person holds the key, the, the, which is the the owner or originator of that of that piece of data. 
Um, and so looking at different data at rest and data in flight encryption methods that uh, provide more integrity and insurance uh, and less uh, trust-based uh, uh, methods. So uh, look for you know a lot of uh, talk in the in the coming months about zero knowledge and and other new new methods for data at rest encryption. You know, I could go a lot of directions with the idea of zero knowledge, but I'm just going to leave it sitting there and, and say that it's a, a new label we're going to have to all learn about. Um, Lou, I want to turn to you. I mean, you do a lot with data around applications. Um, and I'm going to assume that you look at some of the data coming back from anonymized uh, user reports uh, for guidance on performance, uh, stability, and new features. Can you think of a good technique for anonymizing data that the big data analysis techniques can't defeat? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I think, um, you know, obviously applications, especially when when nowadays pe people building native cloud applications, um, especially apps that go on mobile phones, these kind of native apps that go there, um, you know, they tend to have, you know, they could have health, performance, stability problems. Um, and the only way that, you know, that used to happen was customers had to report them. And, and most of the time, customers didn't report them. They get angry with an application, they stop using it, and they move on to the next thing. Uh, but what organizations started doing is started collecting data. So basically they have visibility into what's going on, uh, whether it's logs or traces, it's health information. Um, and so that data becomes really important to not only the value prop for the customer, but also to make sure the organization doesn't ship something that they didn't really know they shipped. Um, and so this becomes a really hard challenge because, you know, maybe collecting the fact that you are on a particular version of iOS and that you are um, you had the app full screen or you put it in dormant mode or something that kind of like the state of what happened and why it happened and why it was you know why the performance issue was happening or why the crash was happening if you don't have that information and nobody reports it there's no really way for you to know how to fix it so is there a new way that we can do this that maybe uh, big data is not necessarily considering? I don't know. I think, you know, we do have to collect some data. You just have to collect something. Um, it doesn't have to be identifiable. Um, it just has to know that in a more general case, that 90% of users that are on a particular version of a particular operating system or an app in a particular environment setting is running into a problem or performance issue or health issue. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be user-based. Now, whether GDPR is considering that still data that's user information um, is, you know, I'm not sure if it's clear. Well, there's a lot about this that is going to be unclear. And it may well be that in the final analysis, we just have to redefine what we think of as privacy. I've heard that argument put forth. And this is obviously one of those things that we're going to end up talking about considerably more in the future because it's of critical interest to enterprises in different markets, different areas of business, and different parts of the world. Well, with that, I know that we've got a great guest coming up. We want to get to her. Lou, I'm going to throw it back to you to lead us forward to the guest segment. Thanks, Kurt. Well, before we get to our great guest, we do have to thank another sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Ahrefs. Now, what is the big challenge when it comes to posting a website for you and your organization? Getting traffic to it, right? Well, where does the traffic web for your website come from normally? Well, you probably already know the answer, search engines. Well, Ahrefs is the key here and actually can help you. They are an all-in-one SEO tool set that is here to help and give you the tools you need to rank your website on Google and, and other search engines. Now, for example, Ahrefs makes competitive analysis easy. Their tools show you how your competitors are getting traffic from Google and why. You can see the pages and content that send your competitors to the most search traffic. Now, you also find out the exact keywords your competitors are ranking for and which backlinks are helping them rank. Now, from there, you can actually replicate or improve your strategies. Now, if you're not getting significant search traffic, Ahrefs tools help to find topics where it's creating pages on or, or content on, and you can easily see estimated search volumes and gauge traffic potential with their Keyword Explorer. 
actually has some really cool tools. I've actually started using this. And it creates a visualization of information that you can actually act on. Now, if you're getting search traffic, data like their top pages report helps break down which of the pages are bringing the most traffic. It's really visibility into what you need to expand your website. Want to learn more? Check out their blog or YouTube channel for step-by-step -step SEO tutorials. That's a seven-day trial for only $7. Go to hrefs.com to sign up. That is ahrefs.com. And we thank hrefs for their support in This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, this is my favorite part of the show. We get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Ryan. Today, it's no exception. We have Lori, Lori McVitie, Principal Technical Evangelist, Officer of the CTO at F5 Networks. Welcome to the show, Lori. Thanks. Glad to be here. Now, Lori, our, our audience really loves to hear origin stories. Can you maybe take us through a short journey of what uh, kind of through tech and what kind of brought you to F5 Networks? Usually it's a plane, but um, <laughs> sometimes I drive there. No, <laughs> so um, I started out in enterprise development, doing development, doing architecture. Um, jumped into Network Computing Magazine, who I think Kurt might be familiar with, and uh, did a lot of lab testing and got into the idea of playing with a lot of products that kind of crossed the line between the network and applications. So at the time, things like caches, uh, XML gateways, layer seven load balancing. And eventually that led to me joining F5 because it was the place I was the most comfortable that, that seemed to marry the networking and the, the application, the programming model together in a way that just made sense with me. So I've been there for 12 and a half years now. And primarily I just know things and I write. And I, I write a lot uh, about a variety of different topics. Fantastic. Now, F5 does a lot of things. Obviously, they were they focused on a lot of NetOps um, and done a lot of work with DevOps and DevOps frameworks. There's there's kind of a shift. There's a shift in applications. There's a shift in how people are building things. They're going from monolithic applications or greenfield apps to more microservices. What what is what does the landscape look like? What are organizations doing? What how are they doing it? And what systems are they using to help? Okay, I should I should have wrote down those questions in line. So what? <laughs> what does <laughs> what does the landscape there, look like basically? Yeah. What does it look like? It's it's a mess. There's we're we're currently kind of in the the fifth generation of application architectures, and some organizations are actually uh, old enough, right? Stable enough. They've been around for fifty years. They have all five generations of applications. They've got mainframe. They've got client server. They've got the you know the the web. They've got the web 2.0, and now they've got microservices. So they've actually got all these different application architectures that they're trying to maintain. Now, generally speaking, most new applications are being developed in using more modern methods. So microservices, cloud native is the new the new buzzword and, and technology that people are using to build apps, but also uh, single page apps are very, uh, very popular, especially when you look at trying to support cross-functional or cross-device uh, users. So we're seeing that there's a lot of different applications. And when you're an organization that has even an older generation, maybe they have client server, or maybe they started with the three-tier web app, that is they move into these new applications and bring in different cloud environments. So now they're multi-cloud. They have challenges around that, right? There's operational challenges. There's often new silos built out. Sometimes they bring in DevOps methodologies to move faster because, well, everybody needs an app, right? There has to be an app for that. I mean, there has to be. And so they're trying to manage all of these things and they end up creating more silos and more problems. So they're they're just struggling with how do we deal with multiple generations of applications? The infrastructure that supports it is often different thanks to cloud and its influence not only on application delivery in general, but also on the data center and how how they build out their networks. And, and so I, organizations are just kind of struggling with, we, we have to do all these things. And then of course we just spent a good amount of time listening to security problems. So doing all that 
and still worry about security on top of it. So the landscape is varied and insecure and kind of confusing right now, which is a good place to be, actually, if you, you like change and you like solving problems. Right, right. So what what are, what is the first step? What do organizations do? Because I know you we hear a lot about organizations trying to embark on this kind of digital transformation or from on-prem to cloud or hybrid. Where do they go? Where do they start? What do they do first? Um, step back and breathe. So just, <laughs> just <laughs> step back. Um, so, you know, way back when we first started talking about things like um, – automation and uh, net ops and multi-cloud as, as opposed to cloud and there was DevOps, there was a whole lot of, of actually fear and angst about automation and how it was actually going to be bad. And it was, you know, robots were going to take our jobs, which, you know, didn't happen. But we actually found that things like automation can really help be a force multiplier across an organization. And that's true for development, it's true for the network, it's true for even the security folks. A lot of people use, they, they practice agile marketing. Believe it or not, they've adopted standups, they do scrum, they, you know, they do the whole kind of methodology, they apply it to different fields. So one of the things you can do to manage all of this kind of chaos is to start looking at, you know, what's, what are the things that we have that we can right now kind of automate and get set in a process so that we can actually think about and put into place plans to deal with all of the new stuff that we need to deal with. Because really it's hard to manage both. I'm jumping back and forth between two completely different uh, you know, worlds and concerns and, and architectures can be very overwhelming. But if you get some of that stuff kind of, you know, just work on how can I reduce the burden of dealing with all of this, you know, day-to-day -day operations. Um, so we have time to actually think about how do we solve these business problems, these technical problems. I think that goes a long way toward moving forward. You don't have to do it all day one, basically, right? Start small, but start moving forward. Right, right, right. That makes sense. I think that we, we talked a little bit about in the beginning about kind of the new architectures out there, microservices, where they kind of teach you to incrementally build out your application and your system and your infrastructure uh, and kind of build it out in a way where organization can slowly kind of add things and make things sure things are working. Now, we, we heard a little bit about in the beginning, I think Brian has talked about it in the past. Uh, we've, we've heard about it in the news about the fact that now F5 and Nginx are kind of integrating things. I hear the thing bridging the divide. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about that and what that means? What that mid is so bridging the divide is is kind of that it's that it's that divide that that I mentioned earlier. Really, right the the transition between the traditional and the modern. And how do you bridge that? It's not only a technical divide. It's it's not only an architectural divide. It's an operational divide, um, and it's also just a culture divide because you have kind of it, it is kind of the the traditional net ops versus DevOps, right? We've got our traditional network stuff to support our traditional apps, and here we have these modern apps, and we want modern architectures and modern principles, and and how do we make these two work together? Um, when these two groups are not used to working together, sometimes don't even share the same vocabulary, and. One of the things that that we've seen is is that really impacts things around application delivery, like security, like scale, like performance. How do you deliver the kinds of uh, services in the network or in the application that can address those? Where do you put the caching? Should it be part of the app architecture? Should it be part of the app infrastructure? Should it be in the network or should it be uh, an outside service, a CDN? Um, those kind of decisions can't be made by one single group because they don't have a holistic picture of what the the entire architecture looks like, what the needs are, and then what the business needs. So being able to bring these together in a way that offers you know a solution no matter where you're going to put it. So if you want to put it in the app infrastructure or as part of the app, you want to put it in the network, uh, we think is going to help customers be able to not only identify the problem and choose the best solution, but then also have the best solution being able to pick right from from both portfolios. Makes sense. Now, I do. I do want to bring my uh, my co-host back in because they. Cause this is actually a, a pretty hefty topic. Lots of things to talk about. <laughs> Chris, I want to throw this over to you first because you had some questions about agility. Oh, absolutely. And you know, you you were talking 
Lori, about the the idea of running into you know agile marketing. Uh, I have talked to organizations where they brag or or admit to being uh, agile organizations where every single department, every part of the organization is run according to agile principles. And my question is really this, are there technological ways that will help departments filled with people who have never had anything to do with software development or IT operations cope with a move to a discipline, Agile, that is just chock full of dev talk? Uh, you know, you were talking about scrums and stand-ups and, and all of the bits and pieces of, of the Agile world that now people in, in accounting and HR and marketing and all of the other departments need to deal with. Is that something that we have application-based tools to help them deal with this? Or is the only real way to help them to go in and... Um, do a basically a forklift upgrade on the culture. Yeah, I don't I don't think you can do a forklift upgrade on culture, right? Because culture derives primarily from the way that that people behave and what their goals are. And it's really hard to change people's behavior unless you first one change what they're measuring and and two, often give them clear explanations as to why they're being asked to change, right? Because I said so is not always right an acceptable answer. So I think I mean one of the things you have to do is kind of translate the agile principle into something more consumable and that in you know involves people like at at F5 we recently had you know renamed basically all our our core values inside right because they were they were too academic um, they were too you know just out there and so we changed them to choose speed right if you have two options choose speed um, Right, we help each other thrive. Right, that's really it's it's communicating and helping. Right, we you know we are owners. All of us, we're all owners. So we all feel ownership and things. And it's it's kind of changing the culture that way by using I think language. Um, you know, as you point out, using dev language is not really necessarily going to encourage marketing or uh, you know the guys in finance to get behind this this agile thing. So you know, trying to translate into that into more in consumable uh, corporate values, I think, really helps because then you can promote that. It's much easier to say, you know, we choose speed as opposed to we will do you know X sprints and and they will be right. We'll have this many stand ups and we'll you know. It just it doesn't translate well into what most people have to do. So I think a, a culture has to be broader than that and it has to be supported and it has to come from the top to say, we're doing this. This is something we want to do and this is why it's going to benefit you. Fantastic. Now, I do want to bring Bam in because I, Bam, let's get to the topic of what Nginx is bringing to it. I've used Nginx in the past. I've used it for load balancing, but it's more than that. And now, you know, kind of the, the amalgamation of with F5, what they're already supporting, what they're already doing with Nginx. Let, maybe let's talk about what that's bringing to the table and how can that help organizations. So Nginx, a lot of people will have one impression or another about what the technology is all about based on their experience. Some people think of Nginx as the world's most popular and fastest web server Others think of it uh, as a reverse proxy. Still others, like you know, mentioned, uh, Lou, is is it's a load balancer. And, and the answer is you're all right. You know, everybody's right. They, and you can use it for a lot of different things. It's a very versatile piece of open source software. And uh, when the news came out that um, we were acquiring Nginx, and this is where I'll throw a question to Lori, uh, you know, it was like, oh, well, F5 is just moving to a different platform, right? Where Nginx is eventually going to replace Big IP for load balancing. And, I, and does F5 think they can force people to, to use that? And I think not only, you know, to what you said earlier, Lori, that it, it offers our customers choice, but maybe can you speak to some of the things we've been hearing about how it's we're finding it in the same infrastructures uh, being used in concert, not as, a, a you know, an either or type of scenario. 
Yeah, there's there's a couple of interesting things. So when we announced the acquisition, you're right. Everyone seemed to focus on the the well, they both have proxies, right? They both do load balancing. They have load balancing proxies and almost seem to forget that uh, Nginx is, is also a great web server, that they have an app server, a multi-language app server, that they do API gateway and, and security functions, um, and that they you know have a very extensible um, you know, platform for plugging in other kinds of functionality into an application. So one of the big things in the that I get very excited about is not, you know, this is this is a new load balancer, but rather this is a new way to deliver things like security or, you know, performance or you know, who knows what's going to come with uh, with microservices, you know, different kinds of functionality right into the application infrastructure. Because when we look at you know, cloud native as an architecture, right, principle, which it is, uh, what we're seeing is that it's it's really kind of coupling the applications with its infrastructure. And that's why you often see it deployed in a Kubernetes environment or, you know, some kind of container-based system is because that infrastructure and the apps are so coupled together that they can't work without each other. And we see Nginx as being one of the top uh, services deployed inside those environments, both as an ingress controller, so to distribute traffic around, but also as just the web server or the proxy inside those environments. So it's, yeah, it could be a choice, right? You could have F5 or Nginx do your load balancing, or you could build, right, this entire awesome infrastructure that is is using Nginx as a base uh, to do that and deliver those applications. And we see that often where F5 is used to make sure that traffic transitioning from a traditional network, which most people have, into these kinds of new environments is a very common use case. It's going to come in through F5, it might be even secured there, and then it's gonna to go to Nginx and it's gonna be distributed all around that container cluster before it goes back out. So it's a, it's a, we've always kind of worked together without working together in the past, and now we'll be able to support that to provide even uh, better visibility around how those work together. And, you know, hopefully bring some new kinds of solutions to market based on that kind of, you know, if, if you'll pardon the use of the word synergy. <laughs> so, so let's follow up on, on that synergy a little bit and how it, uh, it impacts uh, our plans for, uh, you know, the open source aspect of Nginx, right? F5 by, by many of the, you know, the people I talk to, F5 is viewed as like, you know, classic, you know, uh, ITE technology company, you closely guard our intellectual property, and now we go and acquire a, a, an open source project um, along with the rest of Nginx, and certainly a lot of concern about you know what's what's F5's plans for the the open source aspect of of F5 or of Nginx rather, and um, you know you being in the office of the CTO, I know you're uh, you're privy to some of the plans of not only you know continuing uh, support for the, the open source project of Nginx, of course, but actually augmenting it. Yes, yes. I mean, one of the things we want to do is is augment it um, in the sense that, right, we have, we have developers throughout F5 who have, over the years, worked on different open source projects and contributed to them and, you know, of course, consumed them. And we want to do more to encourage that behavior and to support the projects that... Um, that they've been doing even more recently, things around like Nats.io. They're very big into uh, dealing with that. The Aspen Mesh team works a lot on Istio and contributes back and, of course, consumes and builds on top of that for its service mesh platform. And in terms of Nginx, we just we want to amplify that. We think that... Um, you know, given our, you know, I guess, you know, we're we're a bigger company now, and that's how we're seen. But that that gives us a lot of resources to be able to push Nginx and to be able to give them the resources they need to expand on the open source front, because we see that as being a critical component of both applications and infrastructure in the future. And I think, you know, people sometimes miss that infrastructure part that it's actually growing as fast or faster than just open source applications in general. That's that's really where kind of the future is going to lie. And so we're going to invest and we're going to amplify Nginx's existing message and their products to make sure that they're a part of that future. 
Yeah. So and so on that front of of open source, uh, you know, one of the things that that people see a lot of is there's a lot of choice in the Nginx platform. They use plugins similar to the way Big IP is used modules to to augment the platform. Could you you know, maybe comment a little bit about how you know we view the plugin F ecosystem of Nginx? Um, certainly, there's a number of, for example, my favorite thing, Web App Firewall options that you can plug into Nginx today. Uh, meanwhile, we have obviously one of the class leading enterprise commercial firewalls uh, on the market in advanced WAF. Uh, so, so how does how does that how do we see that mix shift kind of uh, going? You know, are, are we going to uh, disrupt that ecosystem, or, or are we going to continue to support that as well? I believe we're going to continue to support that as well. Right. The yeah. um, the plugin ecosystem is, you know, if you say you're going to support open source, you can't go except for this one thing. Right. That doesn't, right. That's that's really not fair to do. So, you know, you have to be able to stand on your, you know, on your your own the I guess the functionality and the capabilities of your own products. And really, the plugin system is something that's very attractive moving forward because that's another mechanism, a place to insert uh some of our application services, maybe some of that security stuff, right, can go in there. Um, and that's actually, right, so something that you want to, you know, continue to, you know, help evolve to test it to make sure it's good, right, make sure that you're involved in it because you're going to rely on that system in the future perhaps. So I don't see, you know, any, I mean, there's obviously, you know, a conflict, but that's, it's always been there. Um, and, it's it's very hard to get someone to move from a platform that they've used for many years, uh, you know, and say, well, now you have to use this new one. Um, it's just as likely that they would run away. Uh, so I, you know, moving forward, it's more, a, you know, look, it's it's supported. It's the plug-in environment, and even if you say, well, this one's, we're gonna get rid of this one, someone else will just build it again because it is open source. <laughs> Right. It's you, you can't actually get rid of it. So um, yeah. moving forward, I think we want to take advantage of that plug in system ourselves and to be able to augment it and make sure it continues on so that everyone has the benefits and the choices in the future. Well, I sense. could go on uh, at, at, at an enormous amount of length because I've been, uh, as, the, as the readers know, like every introduction, or our listeners know, is every introduction over the past few months when Lou asked me what's up, I just say I've been working on, <laughs> on Nginx integration. So I could go on at, 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 at significant length because I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. I'm, I'm also in my 12th year at F5 and, and I'm just as excited now as I was uh, when I first started. So uh, but with that said, I know we are getting a little low on time. Lou, let me throw it back to you. Yeah, so I did. I did want to maybe we're getting a little low on time, but I did want to talk a little bit about like some of the things that people don't really know about Nginx. I think you talked a little bit about them in the beginning. We talk, obviously we talked about load balancing and proxying and so on, but there's these other things like there's a there, there's observability, there's uh, monitoring, there's API gateway capability. Maybe you can kind of go into a couple of those. Go into a couple of those. I think you know one of the things that um, that I like most about Nginx is they're you know I mean they're an application server, but they're also a, a web server in that sense, right? I can go out and I can deploy on the same server, so on unit I can deploy uh, Java, Go, PHP, and use that to serve up different APIs. Right, the backends written in these languages and consolidate the APIs and direct them all uh, on a single platform. That is huge, especially in a a world where you've got you know multiple usually platforms out there. Especially if you're going cross cloud and you've got multiple clouds, you may have different app servers. In, in the same cluster supporting this, it's just an incredible feat to be able to do that kind of technology and, and to be able to support that operationally. And a lot of times I think that's where kind of some of that excitement comes in is, is that at an operational level, they do so many different things and it's all the same no matter where you are. If you're in the data center, you're in a container, you're in the cloud, you're in a, a virtual machine, the operation is the same. And that's actually a very exciting thing because that's what we need at this point in time for you know traditional enterprises to be able to move forward you know they need to do that kind of standardization and, and move forward and nginx brings that to them with 
things like an app server, a web server, a proxy, and then the, the API gateway, which basically allows you to, it's it's not just the ingress control and the, the load balancing at layer seven, but it's also some of the security functions. So being able to scan the incoming requests, make sure that they don't contain right certain things that are, are gonna mess up the application or get passed along to the database and cause trouble. So they also provide that kind of functionality. Now I have seen there. there I saw actually a reference application that there that you guys kind of reference a lot in Genius, which kind of shows how an organization has moved a monolithic application up to Nginx. Um, is like what what kinds of patterns do you see as people are kind of taking their applications and they're bringing them onto the platform? Like what are they doing to to actually start that or begin that? You know, I think generally, especially if they're trying to move into a modern environment at the same time, right? It's just the, it's it's a very small breakdown of existing applications or action, or refact, refactoring more more often the case of like extending, extending the application or rewriting pieces of it, particularly at the API level. So if I'm actually using API calls in my application, I can use that as a breakpoint to be able to split that into uh, a more modern environment and you know put it onto Nginx and then be able to move it to the cloud or a container cluster wherever I want to. So uh, most of those patterns are are still developing because even though we we like to talk like it's really it's it's like just taking over and exploding, um, it's a very slow process because it's often the the most business critical apps that people are trying to move, and that's really scary to try and break them up and move them. So it's actually a very slow process. So we don't see it quite as much as as we'd like. But some of the patterns that emerge are are really around that we're going to we're going to change out our APIs and and be able to move that or else break it into just chunky pieces. I'm gonna remove the database piece and I'm gonna put that over here um, and have that layer doing something else. And then I'm gonna move this other functional piece here. Um, but it's still, it's a tedious process. All right, makes sense. Well, you know, we're running a little low on time, Lori, but thank you so much for being here. But we did wanna give you a chance maybe to tell the folks at home before we close up where they can find more information about F5, Nginx, the, the kind of integration of the two, how they can get started, all that stuff. Um, F5.com, Nginx.com, of course, um, Nginx on Twitter and F5 Networks on Twitter. Um, there's also, we do have blogs that we put out. Um, Nginx blogs are still running on Nginx's site um, and they will have information about, you know, where we're going together and what we're doing. And we'll also do that on F5.com so that we get both of that uh uh, both of the audiences traditionally, uh, you know, the information that they need. Fantastic. Well, I, I, well, folks, you've really done it again. You've just sat through another hour, the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe, according to 9 out of 10 microservice-based functions as a service. But I want to thank you, everyone who makes this show possible, especially to our co-host in crime, starting with our very own BAM, Mr. Brian Harry. Uh, where can the folks find you, Brian, and all that you do? Well, the number one way is uh, at B.A. McHenry on Twitter. Uh, and if you want to find out more about what gets me excited, head on over to F5labs.com. Uh, we've talked a lot about Nginx today, but uh, F5labs.com is our threat research team sharing with you a whole bunch of free information uh, that is uh you know, endlessly useful in, in building your own threat models and figuring out, you know, what it is you need to focus on when you're trying to secure yourself against these IoT botnets. Fantastic. Thanks, Brian. Of course, we, we have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, where can the folks find you, all of your work and your up and coming travels? Well, as always, they can find my work over at Dark Reading. I will point to those and, uh, well, some other stuff on my Twitter feed at KG4GWA. Uh, also check out my Instagram feed, Kurt underscore Franklin. And uh, like I said, I've got a lot coming up. The next three weeks, really, are going to be very Black Hat and DEF CON heavy. A uh, lot of great stuff coming up. I'm talking to a lot of researchers heading into the conference. I'll be doing the same afterwards and uh, have some stories coming up on interesting things like why FPGAs matter to security and uh, why everyone should know about the little bits of hardware that glue all of our systems together. So follow me, hit me up, 
I love to hear from the Twyatt Riot. Thanks, Kurt. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You are the person who drops in each and every week to watch and to listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. And we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen and catch up on your enterprise news. Now, go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twyatt. There you'll find all the information about our back episodes, uh, show notes, co-host information, guest information, even all the links that we do, uh, uh, stories during the show. But of course, next to those helpful uh, videos, you get those helpful subscribe and download links. We can help us support the show by getting your audio version, video version, HD video version of your choice, and you get to listen on any one of your devices as well. It's basically the best way to get stay on top of your enterprise and IT news, especially for that week. Now, after you've subscribed, Share with the show with your friends, family, and coworkers. I definitely do. I share with people at work. I And in fact, they didn't even know the, the show existed. And when they checked it out, they started thinking, wow, I, I don't know how I didn't get my enterprise news this way. So definitely start sharing because it really is the best way to get your enterprise news. Now, if you're going to join, if you want to watch the show live, just remember we also do the show live each and every week, 1.30 p.m. Pacific on Fridays. You can watch that at live.twit.tv. And if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well jump into our chat room as well. We have a really great cast of, of people in the chat room, irc.twit.tv. We get some great information as well as some great questions to kind of guide the show in specific directions from there. So go ahead and jump in there as well. And of course, don't forget, you can follow me, twitter.com slash Lou MM. You can check out all the information I do during my week as well as all the side projects I do and, of course, all the work I do at Microsoft. And, in fact, you can also check out dev.office.com where you can see all the latest and greatest ways to customize and, and enhance Office to make it more productive for you. I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support us each and every week to do this week in enterprise tech. And we couldn't do the show without them. Of course, thank you to all the engineers at Twit. Especially I also want to thank our producer and our co-host, our very own Mr. Brian G. Chiebert. He's our tireless producer. He also he does all the bookings and plannings for the show. We really couldn't do the show without him. Now, I also, before we sign out, I have to thank our TD for today, Victor. It's great to see you again, sir. I, of course, tradition says, what was today's show topic? Uh, well, thanks to Chickenhead and chat room, I got most silos, mo problems. <laughs> <laughs> most silos, mo problems. Very, very close. I would say that microservices is the future, but I would say that was very, very, very close, sir. Maybe next time. <laughs> I'm getting closer. And, yeah, even very, very close, very close. <laughs> but in, maybe next time. And, in, and until next time, I'm Louis Maresca, just reminding you. If you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.